by Hits the Wire, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk about Teofimo Lopez's toughest fight of his career. Right, it took place yesterday against Masayoshi Nakatani. Right, a much taller fighter, a guy with power. This almost looked like Leonard Hearns. Right, a guy with power, a guy who really came to knock Lopez out. Right, the fight went the distance. It's going to be a shorter video here. Just a few observations. First, did not make a pre-fight interview uh, video of this fight, right? I was anxious about it, though, because I've been tracking Lopez's career. I believe Lopez has a very high ceiling, right? So let me just say this. I believe fighters first and foremost, need to adjust to the fight they're in. In other words, you come in with your style. If you're in the ring and you see a path to victory, right? Because the other guy's doing certain things, leaving the door open for other things. In my opinion, you should take that path to victory. So, in my opinion, Nakatani had a chance to win this fight. He needed to forget that he was a knockout puncher. He needed to just rely on his reach and his jab. Right? Understand, Lopez, like Floyd Mayweather, this guy, by the way, has literally copied Mayweather's style. Right? It's clear. I don't care what's said in interviews. I have the highlights of the fight in my favorites folder right now. This guy has literally copied Mayweather's style, right down to the hand placement, the um, heavy counters, the left hook leads, right? It felt like I was watching Floyd Mayweather, and I say that as a compliment. Lopez is very talented, but like Mayweather, Lopez is low volume. Right, Lopez needs for you to be close enough to him so he can counter you. So if you're the taller guy and you have the much longer reach, and if in the early rounds, as was the case in this fight, your jab is landing with regularity, in part because Lopez keeps his hands low. The part of Mayweather's game that Lopez doesn't quite have, right, is Mayweather's movement. Mayweather, when he was younger, was a freak athlete. Look at the Hernandez Hernandez fight, where he's moving out of the pocket and then he comes back to the pocket to throw punches. Lopez doesn't really move out of the pocket, right? If I'm him, I look at Mayweather's legs as I research for my next fight. And then I try to move a little bit more. In this fight, he makes the mistake of staying around the pocket against a guy who is longer armed, who has a jab. Somebody in Nakatoni's, Nakatani's corner should have said to him, dude, forget about trying to hit this guy hard. Throw ego aside. You're winning rounds off the jab. Right? Double and triple the jab. The problem with throwing, you know, punches with the other hand after you are throwing the jab is that it brings you closer to the pocket. And if you're fighting a counter puncher like this, that's what they want. Right? They need something to counter and they need for you to be open where they can hit you. In this fight, Nakatani is the lead. Lopez, right, is the counter puncher. So let me just say this. If you're the lead, if you're the hunter, there's sometimes when you don't want to get in the bushes. Right? If you're the hunter, 
and you're landing shots. You have greater volume than your opponent. You have reach. Your opponent isn't close enough to hit you with hard counters. Then even if that first jab is crisp and hits his head back, if you decide to throw a power punch, make it the hook off your jab hand. Right? Don't throw your other hand. You have a side profile. You got the jab work in here. If that jab's busting up the other guy, great. If you need to throw power shots, just throw hooks off the jab. Understand, too, being a counter puncher, especially one as accurate as a Lopez, takes a lot out of your stamina. He has to be switched on to see the holes that are created by you throwing punches. So what throwing a jab does is it forces him, and he has a hand draped across his body, right? As I said, he's Mayweather. He's relying on his shoulder to block shots, right? He has his hands like this. Force him to put his hands up here. Force him to cover his head. Well, let me say this. Nakatani gets off to a quick start. Gets off to a quick start. Right? Some people could have had him up. Three rounds to none at the beginning of this 12-round fight. Right? At a minimum, he's up two rounds to one. Well, my point is simply this. Why ever have the fight then move to the pocket? If, if you're doing well outside the pocket, why would you ever want to get in the pocket? I don't care if you're a home run hitter, right? If you're up there hitting singles and you're winning the game, folks, you play to win the game, right? That's the point. You're in against Teo um, Fimo Lopez. If you're beating him, go ahead and continue to beat him. What's wrong with that? Well, you know what happens. We get to the middle of the fight. I get the feeling Nakatani thought he was the puncher in this. So he starts trying to open up. <laughs> against a sharp shooting counter puncher. And understand, the key to understanding Lopez or Mayweather is that these guys are coming in with power counters. Right? You're extended... Lopez is opening up, throwing home run punches as counter punches. And Nakatani's feeling the shots. He goes down. They call it a slip. Yeah, that's a slip after getting hit with the punch, folks. Let me say this, too. <laughs> if, I, if I'm like this and a guy throws a punch on me and I catch it with a shoulder or my hand, but the force of the punch throws me off balance where I hit the canvas. Why isn't that a knockdown? Can't you get knocked down off a block punch? So it's really interesting because this is a tale of two fights. Lopez is the more talented fighter. He's the guy relying on skills. Nakatani is the guy relying on size and attributes, and a jab that's working. Well, what happens is Nakatani sees himself as a KO puncher. He came in the fight unbeaten, right? Ego's involved. It's not enough to be winning the fight behind a jab. You're a slugger. You want a slug. So the fight moves from outside the pocket. Nakatani hitting him with jabs from distance. Nakatani's winning that fight. Right? Then the fight moves to the pocket. And of course, the counterpuncher starts to take over. Lopez is gifted. The guy is great defensively, right? I mean, he should be. He has his shoulder in the way. He has his hands here. You're not hitting his body. He bends at the waist. 
He has timing. He's ma he's a master at timing. He's a master at counters. How did Nakatani think he was going to win in the pocket? Let me say this. The one time in my life that I saw a slugger in the middle of a fight get on his back foot out of desperation and actually outbox a master boxer was that first Ray Leonard Thomas the Hitman Hearns fight. Right, Tommy Hearns early in that fight is in the pocket with Ray. Ray, who was really a puncher, right? Combination puncher, heavy puncher. Don't think of Ray as a pretty boy smooth guy, right? He might have been good looking and he might have been smooth. He was really there to hurt you. Ray Leonard hits Hearns in the ribs. Hearns doubles over. You thought the fight was over. But Hearns had a young trainer at the time. Right? Just emerging onto the big time. A guy named Emmanuel Stewart, who would later go on to train Lennox Lewis and Vladimir Klitschko. Right? And Stewart, apparently in the gym, insisted on Thomas the Hitman Hearns, a knockout puncher, learning how to operate on his back foot behind a jab. So what happened next is one of the great moments in boxing. Thomas the Hitman Hearns, hurt by the alleged smooth guy, gets on his back foot and proceeds to outbox Ray Leonard. Right? As I recall it, and I could be wrong, Hearns is winning that fight when he gets stopped late in that fight. And that's after the end of the 12th round, because back then they fought 15. Now here I'm saying, Nakatani, it's a shame that unlike Hearns, who was able to get up on his toes, believe it or not, was able to dance. Right? If Nakatani had a back foot, We'd be talking about Lopez's first loss, right? I don't care what game plan you had going into the fight. If you're at the fight and you're in the corner, you're thinking, wow, we're up three rounds to none. <laughs> this, this strategy we've had has us winning the fight. At, at that point, your advice to your fighter should be, player, keep doing what you're doing. Right. The jab's working. Forget about the other hand. Forget about your dominant hand. Right, This guy's low volume. With your height, you're too far away from him. For him to do quick counters, we're taking away a big part of his game. Right, Nakatani instead thought he could outslug Teofimo Lopez. Lopez takes over the fight, right? The thing with a guy like Lopez, right? The same thing with Mayweather is these guys are so precise on timing that their counters look clean. In other words, as you're looking at the fight, the cleaner shots are being landed by Lopez. The harder shots are being landed by Lopez. There, there comes a time where you start to appreciate the guy's artistry. Right? You start to realize, wow, this guy, this guy is timing things. Now keep in mind, Lopez keeps getting hit up top. But I, you know, there's something in boxing where guys just don't want to beat you with just a jab. They they must think that it's just not, you know, good enough, right? Nakatani's jab was good enough. What I want people to do is to look at the CompuBox numbers for this fight. Nakatani throws and lands more punches. He should have made this a jab fight. Now, has he, if he keeps the jab going after the third round, there would have been increasing desperation from Lopez's corner, right? Somebody in the corner would have said, hey, man, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we're winning most of these rounds. 
Dude, you have to get aggressive. Understand. The knock on a Mayweather, the knock on a Lopez, right, is that their style necessarily means they're going to be low volume and cautious. Right? Mayweather wasn't an offensive fighter. He wasn't going to throw caution to the wind. Right? That defense is always with him. The same thing with Lopez. So you can imagine there has to be a bunch of tall people out there right now who are thinking, hey, look, I'm going to stick a jab in this guy's face. I know Demetrius Andre, the middleweight. If he weighed 135 or whatever these guys weighed, he would think to himself, man, I'm just going to stick a jab in this guy's face and move for 12 rounds. Right? If he can't deal with the jab and the movement, he loses the fight. Right? Why would you want to fight on the front lines? Well, that's the mistake Lopez's opponent made. Now, let's talk about Lopez. You know what? There's certain fighters ruling the roost who I think are making the most of their skills. Right? I am surprised. I'll just say it. I mean, I'm, I'm bonafidely surprised that Deontay Wilder, with what I see as, you know, an A-plus straight right hand, but really only an A-plus straight right hand, Right? I don't see Wilder doing a lot of anything else in the ring. I don't see Wilder winning the slow rounds. I'm one of those people who thought, as I watched that Wilder-Luis Ortiz fight, that Ortiz was winning every round on the judges' scorecards. Right? Until, of course, Wilder, as Wilder does, it's his signature, started knocking his opponent down. Right? I'll concede. You know, you catch up quickly when you're knocking the other guy down. But I look at Wilder and I'm like, wow, this guy has been champ for several fights now. Several fights. Right now, some guys maximize their talent. Other guys, and I'll save them here from scrutiny, don't. Where you look at a guy and you say, man, this guy is so talented. Why isn't he champ? Right? And then the guy, for whatever reason, folds up in big fights. Right? People here online, I'll name one guy. People here online know I'm a fan of Yui Fury. But I'll concede, Yui Fury shows up in big fights like the Joseph Parker fight, and he just doesn't show his A game. Right? You think, wow, this guy's leaving a lot on the table. Well, let me say this about Lopez. Folks, the sky's the limit here. This was about the toughest matchup the guy could face, apart from if Nakatani had back foot skills, right? Then it would have been tougher. But this was the tall guy who had the jab, who could actually keep Lopez far enough away from him, where Lopez couldn't hit him with counters. And this was the tall guy who had more volume than Lopez, right? There are going to be some fights where the guy Lopez is fighting is his height. There are going to be fights where the guy Lopez is fighting doesn't have more volume than Lopez. Right? I'm just telling you, I think Lopez wins all of those fights. So this was really, style-wise, a tough fight for Lopez. The guy he was fighting was unbeaten. Right? Some guys are going to enter the ring and be intimidated by Lopez's record. But not an unbeaten fighter who himself thinks he's the next big thing. So this was a tough fight. Right? And Lopez came through like a champ. I'm just telling you, Lopez has the punching power. Right? Somebody in the comment section of this video tell me why that knockdown wasn't a knockdown. Right? Lopez has the punching power. He certainly has the timing. I agree. He doesn't move as well as Mayweather, but let's face it, Mayweather's an all-time great. You can move a little bit less than Mayweather and still be a damn good fighter. Right? Lopez also has power with both hands. He's not one-handed. The hand he throws depends on what you give him. Right? So I see this guy really making a splash in boxing. I know he talks too much. 
right? I know he's too full of himself in interviews. Folks, that's boxing, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> I know when I was a kid, I got tired of hearing Ali interviews, right? I mean, guys talk, right? Some damn good fighters. I know I, I talk with people and I'll say things like, yeah, Adrian Broner's a pretty good defensive fighter. And people say, come on, man, to hell with Broner. Why? Because Broner talks too much. I'll agree. Teo Fimo Lopez talks too much. But in the ring, man, the guy is masterful. This was an excellent win for him. Let me just give some tips on ways to give him trouble. I believe Floyd Mayweather's toughest fight was his fight against Emmanuel Augustus. Mayweather himself has said so in videos. Right? Against a shrewd counterpuncher like this, you have to turn the fight into an unstructured affair. You have to run red lights. You have to almost allow the guy to hit you with his weaker counters so you can unload on the guy. Right? Let the guy know that this is not going to be a disciplined fight. Let me say this too. If your jab's working, stay on it. Right? Don't abandon it. I don't care what you did in training to prepare for the fight. If you're winning rounds, win the rounds, right? That's your goal in having the fight. Also, stutter punches. By that, I mean a guy is countering you. In other words, he sees you throw a right hand. He's coming in over the right hand, right? If you know that, then fake like you're throwing the right hand. When the counter puncher tries to come over it, have something for him. Counter the counter puncher. Right? Let me say this too. You want to change styles. The counterpuncher is going to adjust every few rounds to you. So unless your style is winning, right? Don't change your winning style. If you're winning rounds, you don't change that style until you stop winning rounds. But my point to you is have distinct parts of the match. Because a counterpuncher is reading you like a book, and they're slow starters. Right? Had Zab Judah against Floyd, who he dropped. I know the ref didn't count it as a knockdown. It should have been. Right? Had Zab Judah, after the first three rounds, said, hey, I'm going to change styles here. Right? I'm going to, you know... And instead of coming in with flurries and stuff like that, I'm going to stay outside now. Right? That would have caused the counterpuncher to have to figure out the new pattern. And they're studiers. So they would take the next round off to do that. In my opinion, you want to change the styles. Right? In addition to stuttering the punches. Let me also say, too, that a counterpuncher like Lopez is going to hide his head, right? He's bending at the waist. He has his hands down here and stuff like that. If you can't find his head, jab his shoulder. It'll, it'll throw them off, right? Jab the guy's chest. You want to still be able to hit the guy because the counterpuncher is hoping counterpuncher slash pot shotter. That's really what I'm talking about. Not the counterpunching combination puncher. Right? The pot shotter is really hoping for a stop and go, slow pace fight. Right? Where their timing and creativity, their pot shots that look good to the judges, register with the judges. Right? You throw off their timing when you make it a high-volume, sloppy fight where you're not around the pocket or you're only in the pocket episodically. Right, Nakatani looked good. To me, he's winning the fight after three rounds. Why ever come and stay in the pocket against Lopez? Right? Why, why throw punches with your dominant hand when your jab hand is working? Right? If you hit the guy with a good jab, why not double and triple it? 
right? Hit the guy in the shoulder. Don't allow Lopez to clinch. Make the pacing of the fight too haphazard for Lopez. That's how I saw it. Let me hear from you. I think Lopez has a bright future. I thought Lopez won the fight. I thought, though, it was there for the taking. If I'm a tall guy who has a lot of volume, right, who's not afraid to just use a jab and a left hook for the entire fight, who's not afraid to be on his back foot for most of the fight, who's not afraid to come in the pocket, throw combinations, then get out of the pocket and stay out of the pocket, then I think you'd have a chance on Lopez. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I look forward to reading your comments. Thanks for stopping by.